Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jacob Labus. Dr. Labus is a cardiovascular anesthesiologist at the at Cologne University, where he works at the University Hospital and is part of the medical faculty there. Dr. Labus completed his medical training at the University of Cologne and University of Zurich, and completed his residency in anesthesiology and intensive care medicine at the University Hospital of Dusseldorf in 2015. He is a member of the German Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine, the German Cardiac Anesthesia Scientific Working Group, and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, yak yak Subspecialty Committee for ECHO, and he's also a member of the ASE. Dr. Labus will be speaking to us about assessing fiber motion with strain. Dr. Labus. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, so I try to share my screen. Okay. So I go ahead. Um, okay. So, okay. So uh, once again, thank for the kind introduction. Um, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to Toronto Perioperative Echo Symposium. Um, and it is my pleasure to talk today about left ventricle fiber motion and strain analysis. And I have no disclosures to declare. And my presentation will contain the concept of myocardial strain analysis first, um, including some technical aspects and advantages and disadvantages of this technique. And I'll give a brief summary about myocardial fiber structure and especially in motion, since it's enormously important to understand in order to perform and interpret perioperative myocardial strain. After this, I'll show clinical examples of intraoperative strain analysis and show how results can be interpreted in this context. Since my time is limited to 25 minutes, this talk will focus on two-dimensional assessment since it's the most available technique and software at the moment. And I would like to begin with a question. What is myocardial strain? Strain is a dimensionless measurement describing a deformation of a structure, typically lengthening or shortening, um, between two time points, for example, and systole and end diastole. And this deformation is expressed in percent of initial length. In the early days of echocardiography strain analysis, color Doppler and tissue Doppler were used measuring myocardial velocity gradients along a scan line, which were then integrated to deformation values as displacement or strain. And this at an individual defined point of the myocardium. And this one-dimensional assessment has a very good temporal resolution, allows fast assessment and direct display of measured data at a certain point without regulatory algorithms of a software. And therefore, there's no cosmetics of measured values. But mainly this technique is not used today since it is extremely time consuming because of dedicated image acquisition and has a lot of limitations as angle dependency and it is prone to artifacts and therefore difficult to interpret. Currently, speckle tracking echocardiography is um, used to measure myocardial strain. This technique has unique properties. It is a non-Doppler measurement assessing the regional and global um, deformation, and it is nearly angle independent. Moreover, this technique is less prone to artifacts compared to tissue Doppler imaging. But what is speckle tracking? Speckles are these bright and dark pixels in a usually 2D B-mode view. And they're just acoustic reflections. And their relations to each other is like a fingerprint of the myocardium. Speckles can be tracked in blocks through the complete cardiac cycle, giving an estimate of myocardial deformation in any direction. And this process is highly automated and highly reproducible by available software for all the great manufacturers of echocardiographic machines. So to answer the question, what is myocardial strain? It is a change of myocardial length over time by measuring the movement of typical acoustic reflections of the myocardium, the so-called speckles that can be tracked during the entire cardiac cycle. Therefore, the underlying technology um, for strain analysis today is called speckle tracking echocardiography. 
and the assessment of myocardial strain is not restricted to a certain point in myocardium or part of the myocardium by this technique, the entire myocardial wall can be evaluated using different but similar 2D views. Similar in terms of configuration and heart rate, since left ventricle movement is reconstructed from different loops by the analyzing software. But this technique has limitations too. Temporal and uh, resolution is lower compared to tissue Doppler imaging. And it depends on good image quality. And there are differences between vendors. Moreover, there's some influence of post-processing on strain values. Last but not least, using two-dimensional evaluation, there's for sure out of, play, out of plane motion of the speckles since the left ventricle is not a two-dimensional but a three-dimensional structure. Speckle tracking echocardiography can be performed out of 3D full volume data sets too, and has the potential to overcome the limitations of 2D assessment, like out of plane motion. It does not rely on geometric assumptions and is able to evaluate the complex left ventricle contractive pattern from a single heartbeat. But 3D speckle tracking has specific limitations, providing it wide application in the clinical practice at the moment. Among them, one of the main factors is the low spatial and temporal resolution, as well as inter-vendor differences. Another aspect is that 3D analysis software is not available for trans echo echocardiography for all manufacturers. And there's limited peri-operative data at the moment. So to summarize the advantage of strain analysis with speckle tracking echocardiography, I would like to say that this is a potential of this technique is a differentiated evaluation of the complete myocardium through the entire cardiac cycle. And it is highly reproducible and highly automated and perhaps even completely automated in the future. I will show you later. So to understand myocardial strain, which describes fiber motion, it is enormously important to understand myocardial fiber structure. And the myocardium of the left ventricle is not a homogeneous mass as often shown in schematic figures, for example, in this wall stress scheme. That falls too short in describing the left ventricle. The left ventricle myocardium has a complex shape with a differentiated fiber architecture, converting a 10 to 50% shortening of the myocytes into a reduction of intracavitary volume of more than 50%, which is normal left ventricular aortic fraction. And to summarize the complex structure briefly, since this is not a talk about left ventricular anatomy, but on fiber motion and strain, I would like to first look at the cross section of the left ventricle myocardial wall. Endo and epicardial orientation of myocardial fibers is longitudinal, where fibers are oblique orientated in the mid wall. And there's a transmural continuum ranging from an angle of minus 60 degrees to plus 60 degrees. And this is because of the double helical structure of the left ventricle's myocardium. Let's have a look on the long axis of the left ventricle. Myocardial fibers beginning in this basal subendocardium descend to the apex turn around and east send as subepicardial fibers back to the base. Between both helices lies the oblique fiber layer in the mid wall. And that's a change from right-handed descending fibers in the subendocardium into a left-handed ascending helical geometry in a subepicardium. And therefore left ventricular contraction is a complex sequence. And because of time not going too much into details since we could talk about fiber orientation and motions for hours, but for clinical purpose, left ventricular contraction can be simplified in four dimensions of motion. First, there's a longitudinal shortening. And second, there's circumferential contraction during systole. And the third aspect is a radial thickening of the myocardium. And because of the helical structure of the left ventricle, the base rotates counterclockwise, while the apex rotates clockwise during the systole, bringing the left ventricle like a tower. And this is the fourth component of contraction, the so-called left ventricle torsion or twist. And all of the components of contraction can be evaluated by strain analysis using speckle tracking echocardiography, since it's able to measure deformation in any direction. Moreover, while strain describes left ventricle contraction during the systole, strain and strain rate describes relaxation and filling during the diastole. 
In the next few slides, um, I will show how this is performed. And first of all, you have to acquire the software and it depends on the manufacturer of an echo machine. But irrespectively which uh, vendor you use or if you use vendor independent software, mostly these applications need to be paid separately. And be aware values generated from different software solutions are not interchangeable. They are similar, but not the same. So as next step, you need the required loops. And for global longitudinal strain, these are the mid is of a four chamber, two chamber, and long axis view. And for circumferential and radial strain, these are the transgastric short axis views that can also be used for the evaluation of left ventricle rotation. Then the software reconstructs left ventricle movement from the different views. And the different loops need almost the same heart rate and configuration of the left ventricle. You need high quality images without greater artifacts and rhythm disturbances. And you need high frame rates, usually above 40 frames per second. But this depends on the software. So next, you have to open yourself the software, uh, whatever it is. You have to import the required views. You have to choose the patient and choose the loop. And I would recommend to start with a long X view first. After this, Ancestol and antidiastol needs to be defined. And this can be done based on ECG or by valve events or both. Um, using software of our vendor in Cologne, these applications suggest Ancestol and antidiastol ECG based. And you can adjust this by defining valve events when you use the long axis view first. As a next step, you have to define the region of interest. This is usually, usually a semi-automated approach where the endocardial borders needs to be defined by the operator and the software generates the region of interest which can be adjusted manually. Care must be taken in to identify true myocardial borders as for example, inclusion of the pericardium would falsely lower calculated strain values. Then further analysis of deformation is performed completely automated by the software. And it presents results of analysis. The software generates values for each segment evaluated, as well as averaged values, presenting the results in form of time strain curve and as mean peak systolic strain. After this, this you have to repeat for all the different views. So at the moment, it's a bit time consuming and you need several minutes for each analysis by this approach. But as often in life, speed comes with repeated practice. And help is on its way regarding fully automated analysis, which are available, but to the best of my knowledge, not explored in the peer operative setting till now. So at the moment, you get values for each evaluated loop and the software averages them and presents results typically in a bullseye view for better orientation of the operator. All in all, it's quite a lot of work, which arises the question, is it worth the effort? So can strain aid in clinical decision making and what's the evidence in cardiac surgery patients? Is it worth to spend all the time and all the money for additional software? And I have to say, at the moment, there are no published guidelines or recommendations for the perioperative strain analysis. And the application of this technique is still in its infancy in the perioperative setting, which is even more true for the intraoperative assessment. But there is some evidence. I would like to present you some clinical cases and a brief summary of existing literature. Most out on strain come from transtrophic echocardiography in awake and spontaneous breathing patients inside the operative setting in steady state of their disease and mainly global longitudinal strain was explored. There are recommendations for normal and abnormal values for the different strain measures, mainly for the evaluation of healthy individuals. But these are not the conditions of our patients. I think that all of us are faced with a different environment every day during echocardiography. There are effects of general anesthesia, positive pressure ventilation, change of loading conditions, vasoplegia, and different periprocedural aspects, all having influence on more cardiac function, and therefore potentially on strain. Although strain is supposed to be less load dependent, which was mainly explored in animal studies, this is poorly understood in humans, which is even more true for the perioperative setting. So I come to my case presentation number one, 
which was a patient scale for isolated on pump cabbage surgery um, uh, with three vessels disease uh, with preoperative preserved left and right ventricle function without higher grade of diastolic dysfunction and without more than mild valvular heart disease and without pulmonary hypertension. And you see the initial mid esophageal um, loops of the patient after uncomplicated induction of anesthesia and ventilation without any vasoactive therapy or pacing. Um, 3D volumetry supports the diagnosis of normal left ventricular ejection friction, which was calculated to be about 55%. But I think having a closer look on the contractile pattern, um, only seeing uh, both loops, um, you can see by eyeballing the impairment of longitudinal function, which becomes obvious assessing uh, longitudinal strain in both loops, um, which is reduced um, by completing strain analysis by mid esophageal long axis views. The systolic global long strain was calculated to be about minus 14%, which is reduced when compared to normal values of healthy individuals. But if this is also impaired for cabbage surgery patients, and is this patient at risk for unfavorable outcome? So what do we know about strain in our patients? First, I would like to present you a study from Tenacle and colleagues from 2013. And they analyzed retrospectively more than 400 patients scheduled for different cardiac surgery procedures, among them 155 having cabbage surgery. And all of the patients had normal left ventricular ejection friction um, assessed preoperatively by transthoracic echocardiography. And they found that 40% of their patients had impaired global longitudinal strain. And in these patients, rate of postoperative heart failure, needs for inotropes, and mortality was increased, with the highest effects observed in cabbage surgery patients with a cutoff of minus 16%. Another recent published study from Korea confirmed their results, including almost 1,000 patients scheduled for cabbage surgery with preserved left uh, ventricular ejection friction using also preoperative transthoracic echocardiography, they found that in their patient, impaired global long strain increased long-term mortality with a cutoff of minus 50.5%. And there's far less data for intraoperative transesophageal assessed strain. But I would like to present you the study by Amabili and colleagues who found impaired global longitudinal strain to increase the risk of post-bypass low cardiac output um, with a cutoff of minus 17% in a retrospective trial, including almost 300 patients were scheduled for different cardiac surgery procedures. Although there was concern about correlation between pre between preoperative transthoracic assessed strain and intraoperative transesophageal as a strain in the past, we could not find a difference in our own data, which was a study we performed from a dear friend Jens Fassel in Dresden, Germany, in cabbage surgery patients with preserved left ventricular ejection fraction without any vasoactive therapy or pacing. Global longitudinal strain remained unchanged uh, between pre and post anesthesia induction. So in our opinion, preoperative global long strain values are comparable to intraoperative pre-bypass values in patients with uncomplicated course, at least in cabbage surgery patients. So to summarize case presentation number one, I think this patient is, is at risk for needs for inotropes after bypass, for post-operative heart failure, and he has increased risk to die after bypass in the immediate post-operative period or in the long run, even though left ventricular ejection friction is preserved. As a second case, I would like to present you another patient. It's a patient scheduled for isolated surgical aortic valve replacement having severe aortic stenosis. And again, with preserved left and right ventricular function and without more than mild other valvular heart disease and without coronary artery disease. And again, you see the initial mid as a full four or five chamber view and two chamber view of the patient after uncomplicated induction of anesthesia without any vasoactive therapy. 
performing 3D volumetry of the left ventricle, left ventricle atrial fraction uh, was calculated this time to be above 60%. And looking again for longitudinal contraction, I think you see it by eyeballing. It seems to be reduced. Which is confirmed by long to strain analysis in both loops and completing the whole analysis, um, systolic global long to strain was calculated to be slightly above 16, uh, minus 16%. So is this impaired for aortic valve replacement patients? And is this patient at risk uh, perioperatively regarding um, the myocardial function? And again, I show you data from Tenacle and colleagues from 2013, this time regarding aortic valve replacement patients. And among them, there were 150. And more than half of the patients with normal left ventricular atrial fraction had impaired global long to strain. And also these patients had increased rate of heart failure, inotropes, and um, increased post of mortality um, after bypass. And although the highest effects were observed in cavity surgery patients, this was also significant for patients having aortic stenosis scheduled for aortic valve replacement. And the results of Tenacle and colleagues were confirmed by a prospective single-blinded study from Baldas Munoz. I hope I pronounced it the right way. And they showed that long digital strain was related to 30 days post-operative mortality and to low cardiac output. With low cardiac output patients having a mean global long to strain of about minus 14% and patients without low cardiac output of about minus 17% with almost the same standard deviation, all measured by transthoracic echocardiography. And these results are supported by a study from Cleveland assessing strain intraoperatively by transesophageal echocardiography, including almost 90 patients in a secondary analysis or randomized controlled trial, showing global longitudinal strain to predict post bypass inotropic support with an odds ratio of about 1.8 per unit worsening in global longitudinal strain. Interestingly, global longitudinal strain predicted inotropic support, where Global circumferential and radial strain did not. So, to summarize the case two, in my opinion, this patient has a reduced global long strain as compared to healthy individuals, but is not at additional perioperative risk regarding his myocardial function. But coming back to the data of Tsang and colleagues who found that global longitudinal strain uh, predicted post-bypass inotropic support, where circumferential and radial strain did not in their population. This is in contrast to the data of Howard Trijana from 2017. Um, and uh, the authors found that impaired strain predicted short and long-term outcome, including maize, needs for inotropes, and one-year event-free survival. And the strongest predictor for outcome was, um, or for worse outcome, was impairment of global longitudinal and circumferential strain. I have to emphasize that they use 3D strain, um, and I'm sorry for this presenting 3D data, although I told you um, I would like to focus on 2D strain, but at the moment there's no good 2D strain um, for this. So, there seems to be more than global longitudinal strain predicting outcome in our patients, which is not surprising as left ventricle contraction encloses much more than just longitudinal deformation. This observation is supported by a recent study published only a few months ago in a non surgical cardiac population from Budapest, and authors included uh, about 350 patients and found um, that global circumferential strain impairment increased long-term mortality, even if global long to strain was preserved. And again, worse outcome at patients uh, with a combination of impairment of circumferential and, and longitudinal strain. So looking again at case number one with preserved um, global left ventricle function, but impaired longitudinal function, which raises the question, which is a compensatory mechanism preventing global function in this patient. And um, changes of left ventricle contractile pattern through change of long, long-standing loading conditions, this is not new. 
This has been already described almost 50 years ago in diastolic heart failure patients, as well in patients with severe aortic stenosis. But to the best of my knowledge, Tsang and colleagues were the first to describe a long internal circumferential radial strain intraoperatively in anesthetized and ventilated patients um, scheduled for cardiac surgery. But the patients had only small impairment of the different strain measures compared to normal, valuous, and healthy subjects. Regarding our own data from Cologne in anesthetized and ventilated patients scheduled for isolated on pump cabbage surgery it with preserved left and right ventricular function without inotropic support or pacing, global longitudinal strain was impaired, while circumferential and radial strain was preserved, and left ventricular rotation and twist was even increased. And there was further impairment of global longitudinal strain after bypass, what was expected, um, while circumferential strain and rotation and twist improved after bypass, maintaining left ventricular atrial fraction. On the other hand, global radial strain remained unchanged during the same period. If this observation is related to patient's outcome, is subject of current investigation at our department. So I would like to summarize my talk um, and would like to say that T, uh, transesophageal SS strain is feasible. It is highly reproducible and automated with unique properties allowing for assessment of left ventricular deformation in any direction. It allows to evaluate the entire left ventricular myocardium through the complete cardiac cycle. And you have to be aware, there are software solutions for almost every vendor of echocardiac machines, but there are differences between the values. Global longitudinal strain is the most explored strain measure today, but there is more than just longitudinal deformation. And I would like to leave you with a future perspective. Since artificial intelligence is involving all parts of science and society, this is also true for echocardiography, and the potential of this technique is increasingly recognized. And to be honest, the future has already begun. Fully automated global long dose strain analysis was described as feasible, efficient, and independently associated with mortality in chronic aortic regurgitation patients. Published already last year in JACE, and for me, the most important fact regarding this study, it was performed with a commercially available software. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Levis, for that excellent discussion of a quite complex topic.